it is those enablers uh, of this turn toward impunity, which is so damaging to our future ability to stand up on behalf of the rule of law and on behalf of accountability, uh, and is just one more factor behind that drop in standing. But it is those enablers that we have to look to. And, and because Trump may leave us, we hope, uh, on January 20th, 2021, but those individuals will still be there, unfortunately, if, yeah. if the trends continue, helping shape what America projects to the world and whether we are a country of laws or just might makes right. Hey, folks, it's Chris. Quick note, the interview we're airing today was actually recorded as part of the Texas Tribune Festival. Usually that's a uh, in-person event. This year it was not. And we had this conversation a few weeks ago. So if you get to the part where we talk about the failure of the Trump administration to address the coronavirus pandemic and are wondering, huh, wonder why they didn't bring up the actual outbreak in the White House that sent the president to the hospital, that would be why. I also ask a question about Mike Pompeo. That's a little unclear. It's just a story about the State Department announcing they would be sanctioning uh, members of the International Criminal Court, the actual judges, sanctioning them like they were war criminals themselves or criminals. Anyway, uh, that's all I've got. Enjoy the episode. Hello there. I'm Chris Hayes. I'm the host of MSNBC's All In with Chris Hayes, also the podcast uh, Wise is Happening, which you are listening to right now, and it's being recorded as part of MSNBC's partnership with the Texas Tribune Festival, uh, the all-you-can-stream virtual event, since that's how events work these days. Uh, My guest today, I'm very excited to speak with Ambassador Samantha Power, the former United States Ambassador to the UN, author of the New York Times bestselling memoir, The Education of an Idealist, which is a great book, fascinating book. Um, We've got a lot of things to talk about because of the world is a flame, and so we're going to just uh, dive right in. Uh, Ambassador Power, it's great to have you. Chris, thanks for doing this. Um, I, let's start. I thought we would maybe start with the sort of U.S. Uh, where the U.S. is in the world right now. It's been striking to me how much the U.S. and there's been writing about this ha- has become a kind of object of pity. Um, around the world, people look over and, and when you look at a place like Vietnam, right, which has, you know, one-tenth of our per capita GDP and has done a much better job of containing coronavirus, Germany, uh, all, all kinds of countries, what does it do to the U.S.? What does it do to U.S. soft power or stature or even just sort of like our role on the world to be having this awful national humiliation? Well, first of all, just to unpack the sources of humiliation and isolation, right, range from uh, Trump attacking people like you in the media, t- attacking democratic institutions, let's not forget, actually stripping the words nation of immigrants from the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service uh, kind of mandate and, and all the immigration restrictions that flow therefrom, the Muslim ban, um, you know, and then and of course, one could go on and we'd lose our 30 minutes, but but then uh, to lead the world in coronavirus infections and in deaths and the mishandling of that. And then, of course, pulling out of international organizations, which he was doing before corona in other realms, but to do so on an issue of such global concern. I mean, that that sort of hits anybody who's themselves fearful about whether corona might come to a neighborhood near them. Uh, right in the gut, right? I mean, for America to walk away from uh, its role and, and to reject even the idea that our fates are connected to those individuals. So it's not altogether surprising, of course, that our standing has dropped. Uh, it is really noteworthy just how precipitous those drops have been, even in my home country of Ireland, where I came from a long time ago, uh, you know, where the, you just have such long-standing warm ties. And it's really, Trump is now viewed less favorably than President Putin and President Xi in many uh, European and friendly Asian uh, countries. And that's that's really sort of striking. I will say, before I get to the sort of the important question that you pose, which is what difference does it make, but uh, people are still distinguishing in many of those same polls between Trump and the United States. So they're still kind of holding out hope that this was something of an aberration. You know, those same places where 
Trump's favorability might be in the 20s or even the teens, according to Pew, you'd see, you know, favorability ratings for the United States as a whole above 50 percent, you know, kind of still hanging on. That, of course, will change if we, the American people, are seen to have affirmed the kinds of decisions and the kinds of results that Trump has brought us. I think the reason it matters, and and Trump is quick to deride these polls and saying, oh, you see, Barack Obama wanted to win a popularity contest in Berlin. Uh, You know, I want to bring jobs to the the American worker. Uh, But it matters because it really, especially in democracies, it really shrinks the space that Democratic leaders have uh, to partner with the U.S., and I think you see that on every, I mean, and some of this you wouldn't, wouldn't play out until it's the rainy day and you really need partners. Um, but for example, on something that the Obama administration, the Trump administration agreed on, which is that European countries need to spend more on defense, Trump's extortionist way of asking for those bump ups in defense expenditures, his Im- implicit and at times explicit uh, at least behind the scenes, explicit uh, threat to leave NATO uh, if people don't uh, start paying up. Uh, you know, that certainly gets the attention of a leader, but that leader then, if it's a democracy and a European democracy, uh, has to go before their parliament, uh, go before their own voters. And if it's, seen, if it's seen to the voters as needing to do something to please a person who has fared worse in terms of competence who is demonstrably uncredible when it comes to the words out of his mouth, but also any specter of threat that he might invoke, right? That is going to just make it a lot harder for those very difficult domestic conversations uh, to occur. And there are, uh, you know, a hundred such examples, but I really do think your question is so important because Biden will be debating uh, uh, Trump here in these three debates and, you know, he will need to move beyond we are isolated and doesn't it suck to be (laughs) mistrusted to this is why this matters to you, American people. This is why we are less safe uh, because uh, the standing of our leader uh, now hovers beneath that of President Putin who poisons his opponents. (laughs) You mentioned um, uh, President Xi and sort of the polling on China um, in the context of President Putin and others, right? It it strikes me that China is sort of the main axis here, and and both the main axis for for COVID and also it seems clearer and clearer like one of the major foreign policy challenges for the next U.S. president is going to be managing the bilateral U.S.-China relationship. It's basically the key to us not burning the planet down. Um, sort of above everything else. And then there's a whole bunch of different ways it can go right now where it seems worryingly like on one hand, we could be headed towards a sort of new Cold War. On the other hand, like the old model, both in terms of uh, industrial trade flows and also just like looking other way while an ethnic minority is um, being thrown into camps doesn't quite work. And the answer to like what to do is very complicated, but it, what do you see? I mean, do you agree this is just a sort of primary foreign policy challenge? And and how do you think through it? Uh, because it's such a, th- a thorny question. We own the thorns, Chris. I think I think you've articulated it uh, very very well. I mean, you know, it's one thing you you hear all these politicians saying, you know, we will compete, we will confront, we will collaborate. <laughs> Much easier said than done, but nonetheless, the, that's the the stew in which we must we must live as we go forward. And it's not like the U.S. Soviet standoff, uh, because as you note, we are so unbelievably interconnected economically, um, because our the fate of our economy is so tied. Uh, to what happens inside China, as we've seen also uh, with the pandemic, um, but well beyond that, uh, as you say, with with supply chains and other sort of sinews and capillaries uh, that run in, 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 in both directions, uh, where there's a kind of uh, codependence of, of some kind that will, I think, get reexamined and maybe scaled back in light of the vulnerabilities that have been exposed over the course of last year. But, you know, it's not, we're not going back to, you know, 1972, right. In terms of us, uh, Soviet ties that, that, that ship has sailed. 
So, uh, and at the same time, as you say, I, I think actually one of the reasons that human rights and democratic values will come to matter a great deal in this really difficult mix of competition and confrontation with needing to collaborate on on climate and and a number of other issues, Uh, but is that in this battle between two models globally, an authoritarian capitalist model and a democratic model, uh, you know, one of our comparative advantages at, at this point uh, you know, one of our, our really distinguishing features is uh, the fact that our citizens, uh, you know, get to speak freely, pray freely, uh, n- not get locked up, uh, we hope anyway, on the basis of their, of their faith um, or their ethnicity. And um, that's something that as we seek to build out the community of people who share our values, that is where we get back in the business of, of trying to lead at the UN and elsewhere, uh, you know, that's really going to matter. And the fact that the United States, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, I mean, if you actually combine our economic heft in the world, then you really start to be able to, to uh, exact leverage, not only on China, but also in that the very large number of countries that feel increasingly economically dependent on China or dependent on China potentially for a vaccine or for PPE, uh, but only by us sort of actually celebrating almost (laughs) with the big caveats associated with our own democracy that, that we'll maybe get into, but, but, but to take note that openness is a virtue and that having these shared values should be grounds for coordinating our actions and for being more effective when we compete and when we confront. That also, I think, if if we have sufficient leverage, uh, will make it easier to hold China accountable for Hong Kong and Uyghurs and unfair trade practices and theft of intellectual property and, and a long list of things that they need to be held accountable for, but still be in a position, uh, because of our leverage, uh, to be able to, to sit China down and sort of somehow find a way forward on issues of shared concern as we did, you know, in the, in the Paris agreement context, but in a very different, as you say, a very different geopolitical context with, with a much, uh, you know, sort of more stable, uh, uh, and much more accommodating, mutually accommodating, right. uh, relationship. And that, that I, I don't think there's any going back to that kind of backdrop for cooperation. So I think leverage is going to be a huge predictor of whether we can sit them down. In addition to the fact that, by the way, on one reason that we can feel freer, I think, to compete and to and to hold them accountable uh, on, on human rights issues, hopefully in greater company than we do now uh, in, a, in a broader coalition, but is that by definition, that set of issues that we need to sit down with China on are issues of mutual concern. And so to have also the confidence of knowing that President Xi also can't afford uh, to let the planet burn. I mean, it, we, li- we do live on the right, same right, earth, right. and that interdependence creates necessities and exigencies on their part as well. We'll be back after this quick break. It's interesting when you, when you mentioned, like, you know, we're not, it's, this is not a 1970s, right, U.S.-Soviet Cold War model to think about. And yet, when you talk about, like, the idea of two competing models, I mean, right, there's, like, that's a very, I think, clear and present part of the sense of kind of post-globalization, right, what it looks like. And I, to to bring it back to the coronavirus, I mean, when you think back to the sort of Soviet propaganda war with the U.S. over things like, you know, the Khrushchev kitchen table debate and and, uh, sending the, you know, the first spacecraft, right, with a dog in it, and, like, that was a big deal, like, the Soviet models, you know, their engineers figured out how to send something up into space before we did, and we were racing with them, you know, if you if you transported COVID back into that uh, context, it would be like, oh, the Chinese model's better. Like they, yeah, like they crack down, and yes, you get ninety temperature checks, and you've got surveillance tracking you everywhere you go. But there's probably several hundred thousand Chinese alive and walking around now because their like authoritarian <laughs> surveillance model was able to suppress a disease that our like open, happy d- democratic model has completely failed at. And it seems to me like it, there's there's like a real tangible way in which like when you think about these two models in some kind of competition or something that the world is like, you know, evaluating that like 
their response in the beginning looked horrible, but it doesn't look as horrible now when, when you compare it to ours. I think that's right. I mean, I, I, I that is, I think that people are drawing, inevitably drawing that lesson, right? They, they, China already had going for it, uh, you know, the rejection of the longstanding assumption that prosperity and freedom civil and political freedom needed to go hand in hand. So it already sort of, uh, you know, boasted to the world, look, that argument no longer holds. Now uh, they're saying, look, uh, when it comes to a crisis, you know, who do you, who would you prefer to have in charge? Yeah. Yeah. President Xi or President Trump. But I I mean, let's, let's unpack this a little bit, Chris, because we're, we we don't need to, uh, even if that impression is one that China is seeking to, to project, you know, I think we need to distinguish the like and the unlike, right? I mean, we have in President Trump a uniquely catastrophic denier of science, right? There's not one president uh, in the last hundred years who would have rejected scientific expertise, even sort of bureaucratic procedure, uh, would have, you know, rejected global cooperation when there was a chance actually to glean insights from other countries, with a staggered spread of a disease that, that the only benefit of which is that you actually get to learn from what has come before and be prepared for it. I mean, a challenge that America would have under any leader, and we live this in the Ebola crisis, is federalism and is the fact that you do uh, whatever about authoritarian or democratic or closed or open, there just is the fact that we have uh, the, the 50 states who each you know, fundamentally are going to be driving the, the, the state response. And this is an issue on elections as well, and election protection and, and preventing election interference. There are these really important national security issues uh, where everybody expects the, the federal government to, to put in place a plan and execute that plan, or should expect that. Um, and yet the actual authorities um, lie elsewhere. And, and the, in a polarized world, the willingness of Republicans potentially to listen to and heed the admonitions or even just the guidelines, because sometimes that's all the federal government can muster, uh, or, the, or to be responsive to the convening power of the federal government, you know, polarization can, can really uh, mess with that. And again, we saw yeah. that on Ebola in a big way. Uh, now you you see, of course, Democratic governors and many Republican governors just ignoring, uh, you know, Trump's guidance and even that of his of his what are meant to be very technocratic science based agencies. But but all of this to say, this is a pretty distinct um, departure, I think, from what Democratic leadership has looked like in the past. Not that we've ever dealt with, uh, you know, anything quite like COVID, and there are plenty of democracies that have uh, not, nobody has, uh, you know, has kicked this thing and, and it really inoculated themselves. The, probably the closest is Taiwan uh, and actually shows in some ways the best contrast uh, because it, even though there are restrictions on privacy and trackings, you know, via cell phones and things that probably would go too far in many democracies, by and large, it's been a crowdsourced uh, uh, response Civil where people, you know, yeah. incredible. Civil society, yeah. social media companies actually playing, yeah. hooray, a constructive role. Uh, trust in government growing, not uh, receding as the, as the crisis unfolds. But my point is, I think that if you, if you look at the key ingredients for a response, you know, beyond what China is trying to put out there, and what Trump in some ways, uh, you know, makes more resonant every day, he bungles the response uh, in, in a new way or, again, re- re- sort of uh, sidelines the actual assets that we do have in this country that could make us, uh, uh, you know, a, a leader in, in many dimensions of this. I think the key ingredients are legitimacy of leadership, uh, you know, trust frankly, some far more unity than we have in our democracy, uh, at least an ability to rally around the flag on some issues. <laughs> I mean, in many of the, again, those democracies that have fared well, like Taiwan and New Zealand, I mean, it's not as if they don't have issues of political division. Of course they have those, but those gave way in the main uh, in in the face of a crisis like this. Uh, but, but I think people will draw the correlative lesson, and it's part of the larger question about whether... America's recovery and standing, you know, it will not be simply about who wins an election and whether we like alliances again or whether we treat 
you know, other leaders respectfully and, and stop you know, cozying up to autocratic leaders. It will be about whether we can show our competence, whether we remind the world that we, yes, we're not just a country of more Nobel Prizes in the sciences and medicines than, than any other country in the world. It shows when it, when it matters right. for our citizens and when it matters for the world. Yeah. I mean, I want to be clear. I don't, I don't think the argument is correct. I just think that like from a propaganda perspective and they're um, milking they're, it. They're, they're, yeah. And they are they're milking it. it. And, and there's, you know, it's like, it's almost like this sort of in your fit, you know, these pictures of like, here's the first day of school. Here's a concert where everyone's like topless and on top of each other in Wuhan. It's like, whoa, what? Like we can't go to an Applebee's. Like, <laughs> they're having a, so I, I, I think it also, to me, what it also connects to, you know, the sort of idea of that sort of seventies, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, two models, Cold War sort of divided world, um, and then the kind of the victory of sort of neoliberalism and globalism and the Fukuyama book and the idea that like the world was getting more democratic, sort of ine- inevitably and inexorably, um, and now this pr- profound sense of democratic retrenchment, right? That we've seen um, c- countries move away from liberalism, recede away from elections. Um, you know, Putin's Russia and Erdogan's Turkey are two examples, but there's real concerns, obviously, about um, democratic retrenchment in Brazil, and there's concerns about democratic retrenchment in, in Hungary and even Poland and in the United States. Like, I guess, how do you view our experience now and the and the stakes for American democracy um, in in the kind of international context? As someone who spent a lot of time looking at the ways in which democratic governments can start to degrade towards something else uh, in foreign contexts, how you think about it, what's happening here? Well, for starters, I, I think that it's really worth unpacking a little bit, you know, where, uh, where these trend lines have, have, have gone over the last uh, decade and a half. I mean, it is 14 straight years of freedom, at least as measured in terms of civil and political rights, declining around the world. Eight of those years were when I was serving in the Obama administration. And so Trump himself is both a symptom, I think, the the gravitation toward a self-styled strongman, even if he's demonstrably weak in a whole series of domains. That's what he's, that's what he sold himself as. You don't like chaos? Like I'm your order guy, you know, you, and you know, st- the more you, he can stir up fear, whether in law and order or anything else, uh, the more he presents himself uh, as a solution, even though, of course, the chaos uh, has been massively exacerbated uh, by him and on his watch. So, so he, sim- symptom, you know, is a symptom, I think, of what you've seen in Hungary, in Poland, in the Philippines, uh, this kind of reversion to uh, a belief that there's an individual who can come along and, and solve your problems, a sort of move to personality-based politics from, you know, faith in institutions, democratic institutions. Uh, we'll come to it, but Trump is also, of course, an accelerant of those trends in making, in really fostering, not only domestically, but internationally, um, the idea that that there is impunity and that leaders can do what they want. And, and that certainly, in terms of foreign policy, that America is not watching, right? Go at it. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman, do your thing. Uh, poison? What poison? Uh, Putin, yeah. you know, what, what you're asking me about that? Oh, I, don't, you know, I don't have a comment. You know, what? <laughs> what? Uh, and that sort of age of impunity, you know, now, you know, you can project out. It's going to be very hard uh, to, to sort of turn back the clock uh, given that sense of emboldenment and given, frankly, the fact that norms are, are fragile and part of norms working and constraining individual behavior and state behavior is some kind of intuition that others are doing it too. And that there'd be some cost somewhere if you didn't, even though you're, you, you know, again, the power of norms is that you're not really doing this calculus day to day. Well, now people are really starting to do the calculus and they're thinking, hmm, right. Right. actually I can, right. I can probably get away with this or that. So that, you know, irrespective again, of who wins the American election, that those trend lines were underway. But what was the oxygen that these leaders really fed off? I mean, I think there's always a base in in any society of people who might have been drawn to a populist and xenophobic message, but the numbers increased because people were feeling 
tremendous dislocation in terms of their economic plights, perhaps in terms of above all, I think their, their dignity and their, and their sense of self-respect or that they could deliver something for their families, come home at night, feel good about themselves. And, and when that, when you lose that, uh, I think the propensity to listen to somebody, not only who's promising order and change, but who has found you a villain <laughs> to plant your, uh, your grievances. Yeah. I, I think that's the, the pattern that you see in so many of these examples, but it's, it, there's a lot of historical contingency. I, you mentioned Fukuyama and I think you and I came of age, I'm a little older than you, but you know, in that generation where this idea of this inexorable progress was, you know, there's motherhood, there was apple pie, and then there was liberal democracy, you know, it was all going to work out. And, you know, what's sad is I see my students enter, entering a world where they're kind of told the exact opposite, right? That it's an inexorable <laughs> set of trends, right. but toward what? Toward the China model? Really? Like, actually, there's there's nothing sort of superseding that lies in each and every person, a, a kind of longing to express themselves, a longing to hold accountable leaders who are failing you. I mean, look at the early phases of the China pandemic and the rage on social media and and even when the costs of expressing that rage are what they are. I mean, yeah. when, when one is one's expectations are disappointed, you are going to see people longing uh, to, as we see in this country, <laughs> uh, to participate, uh, to throw the bastards out, to, to practice accountability and to express dignity and agency in, in this other way. So I think that, you know, you, you, it's, it's far too soon to write the obituary, but America, just as Trump has been an accelerant of the age of impunity, so too, you know, having in place an America that is prepared to lead on this set of issues, that is prepare, prepared to hold itself accountable uh, to a set of standards in terms of what our own citizens are, the, whether there is equality or anything, whether the, the trend lines are even moving in the right direction on race or on gender or on anything else uh, domestically, but as well uh, with humility after these four years uh, to be in a position where other leaders are like, ah, dang, they're back. <laughs> you know, now we're going to have to be hearing the whining about, about, you know, this attack on the media, you know, now I'm not actually going to be joined by the American president, uh, attacking judges and fake news and enemies of the people. Right. Darn it. Right. Now Joe Biden's going to be on me. And well, maybe. Right. So my point is that there are a lot of interdependencies uh, in all of this. And I think it's a scrum. I mean, look at the people of Sudan, uh, you know, all these trend lines, China's on the rise, China support means that things are going to go in an inexorably undemocratic direction. You know, the Sunnis people, including Sunnis women, didn't get that memo, right? And they went out day after day. Two thirds of the protesters in Sudan last year were women, and they now have uh, a really difficult odds. You know, really tough. Uh, lots you could have to handicap their their prospects. But Bashir, you know, person responsible for genocide, who was counting on Chinese backing and those trend lines, you know, is now sitting in jail, and they're talking about potentially even sending him to the International Criminal Court. So even with these trends. There are these carve outs that show human agency uh, yeah. in all of this. Uh, you just mentioned the International Criminal Court, and and I, I just uh, I, I feel like I, I need to ask you about this before I let you go, because, um, you know, the ICC is kind of the sort of institution that I think like the you know, what if you go back through your work in America and the age of genocide, like uh, the, the idea of having some like you know, internationally constituted body that can actually adjudicate like crimes against humanity or war crimes and, and be staffed by people from different countries and actually produce a kind of level playing field of accountability where like, yes, like the U S could be subject to jurisdiction. It's not just Victor's justice, right? That like the ICC is all those things. And because it's all those things, at least in conception, it's always been opposed by the American right. Um, you know, it's like the, Jesse Helms 2.0's feeling about the UN, right? Like who's these these people? But the, the Trump administration, Mike Pompeo, it was in the news for a half a day, in which we individually sanctioned members of the ICC as if they were the war criminals. Like we attach sanctions to them the way that we would to like a Russian gun runner who's like shipping weapons illegally all over the world. 
to the judges that are attempting to bring to justice actual international criminals. It's like completely backwards and abhorrent and shocking. And I just would love to hear your reaction to it as someone who's invested in the kind of system of justice that the ICC could represent, does represent. Well, I, I should mention that the threat was also to sanction their families, right? right? As if, you know, and again, the damage this does to U.S. credibility to, you know, where we pride ourselves, if our democratic model uh, you know, has at its core anything in the justice space, you know, it is the idea of due process and individual rights and so forth. And suddenly, uh, you know, you're, you're sanctioning people who are studying evidence of grave crimes against humanity and mass atrocity I mean, to even make it onto the docket uh, of the International Criminal Court. The, court, the bar is I mean, in part because the U.S. helped draft the Rome Statute. The bar is really high. And as you say, for the response uh, to be to shoot the messenger, when what you need to do in the, in the face of international justice in order to you know, be able to just rely on your own sovereign system is simply to carry out thorough investigations of your own, to investigate people who are accused of, of war crimes and crimes against humanity, and have accountable justice whether within your military justice system or within your uh, criminal justice system. And let's not forget, Chris, that the decision to sanction these international civil servants comes alongside the decision to pardon people credibly accused of war crimes. So back to the age of impunity, because it's all related, is simply the message to everyone is we can do anything we want. Why? Because we can. And, be, and, and the mystery is not that Trump would seek uh, that kind of impunity for himself and his family, and as we've seen, his his corruption and his self dealing and all of the rest. The the mystery and the thing that has to change is is why so many people who may not have liked the ICC, but certainly believe that American soldiers who committed war crimes should be held accountable. Indeed, Lindsey Graham himself was a jag no less, right? Actually part of enforcing this military justice system. It is those enablers uh, of this turn toward impunity, which is so damaging to our future ability to stand up on behalf of the rule of law and on behalf of accountability, uh, and is just one more factor behind that drop in standing. But it is those enablers that we have to look to. And, and because Trump may leave us, we hope, uh, on January 20th, 2021, but those individuals will still be there, unfortunately, if, yeah. if the trends continue, helping shape what America projects to the world and whether we are a country of laws or just might makes right. Um, Samantha Power is former U.N. ambassador, uh, U.S. ambassador to the U.N., author of, among other books, Education of Idealists, which is a fascinating memoir about her time, uh, both before and during that position, um, and will probably be in public life again at some point, if I had to uh, take a guess. You don't have to make any news here on the Texas Tribune, Why Is This Happening podcast. But um, it's always great to talk to you, Samantha. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. We always love to hear your feedback. You can tweet us with the hashtag withpod, email withpod at gmail.com. Why is this happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In Team and Kate Shaw, and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here by going to nbcnews.com slash why is this happening.